So this is actually part two of a video I did with Philip from the Thrifty Tool Shed channel about why electronic things fail and how manufacturers design the failure rate right into the things you buy. If you want to see part one first, click here and it'll take you to part one and then come back here to see part two or just watch part two right now and I'll give the link to part one again at the end of the video. It actually doesn't really matter which part you see first. So, how do we know how long a product is likely to last? Well, we could build it and maybe make a thousand of them and then run them for 10 years and keep track of how many fail every year and we'd have a pretty good idea of the reliability of the product and how long or short the warranty should be so we don't lose our shirt as a manufacturer. But if we do that, our competitor will have cornered the market way before we start selling the product. Luckily, there's a quicker way. Everything is made from a collection of simpler parts and usually some software as well. And the manufacturers of those components know the failure rates of each one of them, either by testing or experience or some combination of both. Here's a good example, a power supply. The spec sheet tells us that it has a mean time between failure of 218,000 hours. So if we have a bunch of them and average out the times they fail at, we get about 24.9 years. That's 218,000 hours. What if our product also uses an embedded motherboard? And in this example, the mean time between failures of the motherboard is around 173,000 hours or 19.7 years. Well, now the chance of either one of these two devices failing, and all it takes is one failure to make our product fail, the failure rate, the mean time between failures of the product, must be worse than the worst of the two. In this case, it must be less than 19.7 years. And it turns out there's a simple formula to figure out what the combination is. And the formula is 1 over the mean time between failure of the combined item is equal to 1 over the mean time between failure of the first part and 1 over the mean time between failure of the second part. So for our example, well, here's the equation. The combined result is a mean time between failure of about 11 years. And this is a very real example because it's two things I'm going to be using for a project in a future video. Now, if the mean time between failures is 11 years, it means very few of our gizmos are going to fail in the first year or two. And that's why warranties are usually about that long. But I did leave out two things. The first thing is, well, during the first days or weeks of operation of your newly bought product is when you get a lot of manufacturer's defects rearing their ugly heads and causing the device to fail. And then, after a long time of use, things start to wear out and you get failures at that point as well. So. Those manufacturing defects, what are they? Well, it could be something like a speck of dust in the clean room of a semiconductor plant making one particular transistor operate not quite as well and overheat at a lower current than it otherwise would and that not being caught during testing of the product or as Philip showed us in his example, a snap ring wasn't properly seated during assembly of the product and that was discovered during initial use of the product by the consumer. Higher value electronic products or products of any kind are often burned in for 24 hours of more to catch those types of initial failures. Whereas if you're spending 50 bucks on the cheapest network switch you can find in a superstore, well, they probably didn't do much testing of that kind at all. Now, mechanical devices, which are the type of things that tend to wear out at the end of life of a product, are another interesting example, and fans are a great example of that. And that's because they fail quite predictably after a certain period of use. Years ago, I owned a couple of GM Safari and Astro vans, and somewhere around every 80,000 miles, 
almost like clockwork, the vent fans would fail. And that turns out to be after about 2,000 hours of operation or so. Computer fans are also notorious for that sort of thing, but they have longer lives, typically 20 to 80,000 hours or two to eight years. Now that might seem long, but if you have a server rack with hundreds or thousands of servers in them, well, even that type of lifetime results in a lot of need for repairs. And electrochemical items, batteries, are another example of things wearing out. Lead acid batteries, like car batteries, typically have a rating of somewhere around 100 charge cycles in a typical lifetime, as do lithium ion batteries in cars and phones. And that's even without the phone manufacturer helping you by artificially lowering the useful storage capacity of the battery as the phone ages. And exactly how many cycles, and I did say a thousand cycles, you get out of a battery and not only depends on things like storage temperature and operating temperature, but also on how fast you charge or discharge the battery. The slower, the better. So it is a little bit unpredictable. Now, how do their manufacturers decide on what to put in their products to give them more or less operating life? Well, there's one simple word for that, money. And that might sound bad at first, but it's really more about the reality of having to survive in the marketplace. For example, take a $100 Wi-Fi router. It may have a couple of hundred microfarad electrolytic capacitors in it, and in manufacturing quantities, they probably cost about three cents a piece and would have a mean time between failures of a thousand hours at 105 degrees Celsius. Now, we're going to keep our capacitor and router way cooler than that, but it still might be in a pretty hot place, maybe stuffed between a TV set and the back of a computer or something like that. That's still a fairly short period of time. We could splurge and spend twice as much, maybe six or seven cents, and get a 10,000 hour capacitor. And that means it'll have a mean time between failures of about a year of operation. Again, at a fairly high temperature, so probably two or three or more years at a more reasonable temperature that we might expect in normal everyday use. But what if we were to splurge? And instead of using electrolytic capacitors, which tend to dry out and fail over time, we used ceramic capacitors, much more expensive. And in our example, instead of three or seven cents, the capacitor would cost a buck. And its mean time between failure will be so high, it's not even given. So for two bucks more per router, we could go from a mean time between failure of a few years to something way beyond that. So how significant is that two bucks? Well, the manufacturer has to make some money and what they'll typically do is mark things up. So they'll mark the two bucks up to four bucks and then the reseller also has to make some money. So they'll double it as well. So what that means is with our way better capacitors, the hundred dollar router now costs eight bucks more and costs $108. And that might not seem like very much. And certainly if I saw a router with a mean time between failure that was way longer, I'd easily pay eight bucks more, but they generally don't even give that because nobody would know to look at that. And for that matter, most people would just look and say, hey, the hundred one is probably just as good as the hundred and eight dollar one. I'll save eight bucks. Now you can bet that resellers like Best Buy and all the giant superstores and manufacturers like D-Link and TrendNet and many others know exactly how many more or fewer products they will sell depending on slight increases or decreases in the selling price. There's no point making the best router or cell phone or car in the world if it's so expensive nobody will buy it. So selling stuff depends on a delicate compromise between making it just good enough to look appealing on a store shelf and at the same time keeping it cost competitive and also having it survive long enough that it doesn't associate your brand with bad quality. And if you do that just right, 
the customer will be pleased enough with it to buy another router of your brand again when it does fail. And that is, of course, a bonus too. If it fails in a reasonable amount of time, you, in fact, generate another sale. Some manufacturers have fought with this and gotten a good enough quality reputation so that people pay more for what is perceived to be reliable stuff, and Toyota immediately comes to mind. Many of their competitors have decided to go the other way and have cheaper products that aren't quite as reliable. So should you buy that extended warranty? Well, on average, it's a bad idea. Since most things fail shortly after they are first put into service or many years past the warranty period, and hardly ever within that one to two year extended warranty period, which is why selling extended warranties is so profitable. Now, this does not take into account the absorbent cost often associated with fixing an expensive or complicated electromechanical device like a camera or a washing machine, even if it's only a three cent capacitor that's failed. So for bigger items where the cost to repair is really close to the cost to replace, it can be worth it. Even the chances of the failure during extended warranty period is slim. So I hope you have enjoyed this video today. See you next time on my channel, Thrifty Toolshed. If you haven't seen part one from the Thrifty Toolshed channel, click here and Philip will show you what parts of things usually break. And he has plenty of real world examples from his extensive experience with electromechanical devices. And see you next time on this channel, Electromagnetic Videos.